Hi, I'm Rebecca Rouse. And I'm Derek Horrocks. Welcome to Hull on Estates. You are listening to episode number 598. Today, Garrett and I are going to be discussing the topic of the execution of wills and how COVID-19 has impacted that and how it may impact it into the future as well. This topic came up initially because there was a recent Global Mail article that was brought to my attention entitled Ontario Eyes Converting Emergency Pandemic Measures on Wills into Permanent Legal Reforms. I'll, we'll leave a link to that in the description for this podcast. Before we get into the article though, we want to talk a little bit about the background. Ontario is a strict compliance jurisdiction, right Garrett? Yeah, so back in the, I guess, the, the olden days of pre-COVID, bills were typically executed in a lawyer's office face-to-face -face with witnesses or, you know, lawyers got to make house calls, but everything was typically done face-to-face. -face. And, and that's consistent with, as Rebecca pointed out, Ontario is a is what's known as a strict compliance jurisdiction for the purposes of will drafting and will execution, which means that there are specific legislative provisions that must be complied with for a will to be to be held to be valid. And in this case, and our, our, our regular viewers and, and listeners will, will know that Ontario Succession Law Reform Act, uh, sections four to seven, specifically set out the, the provisions that are required for, for a will to be valid. And, and they're quite straightforward, but uh, you know, in the circumstances of a the pandemic, they're, they're quite significant. So the first requirement is the will must be signed at the end by the testator or by another person in the presence of the testator at the testator's direction. And the second requirement is that the will must also be executed in the presence of two attesting witnesses who will also sign the will in the presence of the testator concurrently or simultaneously. Um, and if a will meets those two criteria, then it's prima facie held to be valid, subject to other challenges. And that's what's meant when we talk about it as a compliance jurisdiction. And so we can see why that may cause issues in the midst of a pandemic when there's a need to physically distance from each other and quarantine and all that kind of thing. So as a result of, of COVID-19, there have been some emergency measures put in place this year to allow us to kind of get around, not get around, we're still complying technically, but kind of a more in a more flexible way so the most significant change i guess would be that wills are allowed to be remotely signed so one one way was that I, I, well, the first option that came out was that the, phys the same physical will had to be sent around so the testator had to sign it and then it got sent to the first witness and then it got sent to the second witness the same original obviously that can be a little inelegant. Uh, there's a lot of couriering around. Uh, there's a lot of time taken up um, to sign just the one document. So that wasn't a perfect solution. Then there was also an option to sign the will in counterparts, which then you had each person, the testator and the, each witness, or if the witnesses happen to be together, each had their own copy. But again, that's kind of bulky. Then there's three full copies of the will that you have to put together to be one original will. So, I mean, it, it, it helped us get around the problems of COVID-19, but there wasn't really a perfect solution. But now that the move towards the digital kind of realm has now gotten people thinking, I guess, is, is what happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So electronic wills are, are surprisingly, I wouldn't say popular, but they're, they're recognized in other jurisdictions. Um, like the U.S. and Australia, both of which kind of have their own kind of regimes for electronic wills. Uh, in some states in the U.S., the applicable legislation specifically, specifically refers to the validity of or, or the applicability or validity of electronic wills. And in other states, you know, the legislation has been kind of broadly interpreted to also apply to wills that are that are signed kind of electronically. And, and what that means is the I, I guess the signature to the will is is affixed electronically by, by PDF or whatever program is used. Um, so that, that's common in, um, in the U.S. and Australia. They rely on what's known as the substantial compliance kind of doctrine, which is that's, it's, it's a departure from the strict compliance doctrine that we have in, in Ontario, which means that substantial compliance means that a court can essentially determine that a will is held to be valid, even if it doesn't comply with the formal requirements. 
if the court is, is satisfied that the will you know, accurately represents the intentions of the testator, the court can, can declare the will to be, to be a valid will subject to any other challenges. So it's not quite as strict, but in Australia, that's helped to have been, to apply, to have been applied to wills uh, executed electronically. So it, it's, you know, it, it's a bit of a, an outlier for, for Canada, but, um, you know, certainly with the pandem pandemic having thrown a, a wrench into the cog here in terms of in-person meetings, I mean, it, it's certainly something that, that might be considered, and it's something that this uh, Golden Mail article goes into a bit of detail about. Right, and it's interesting too. the The article mentions this survey, I guess, recently, where like eighty four percent of Canadians thought that online wills, virtual wills, were already valid. So I guess that you know the other jurisdictions is kind of bleeding into Canadians' understanding of what wills are as well. So so yeah. So the the article now that you've brought that in, it it mentions that Ontario kind of put out a call for members of the legal community to give input into whether there needs to be some reform to bring more digital aspects into the execution of wills. And it mentions a couple of different proposals. So one of the proposals is, is basically kind of what you've just described is that we move to a whole virtual will system. So, so that's, a proposal but then on the other end of the spectrum one of the other proposals says don't don't do it, it there's too many risks and it's it's just not worth it so maybe we should talk about those those risks i mean one of them is that you don't know who's in the room like normally if you're meeting in person you can see the whole room you're in the room you've got the door closed you know who's there who's talking to the testator but it's a little tougher over video because you're only seeing what they're their face and what's behind them so that that's a risk there's a risk of potentially fraud i mean the, but the problem is that there's these risks kind of exist no matter what because even if you're in the same room as a testator you don't know who talked to them right before they came in the office or who, right before they were driven to your mm -hmm. office or or whatnot so that's always a concern a concern as well yeah, and also any any kind of regime that relies on on wills being executed or stored electronically is going to be subject to, I guess, the, the frailties of like technology and security, right? I mean, are these wills are, are these wills properly safeguarded? Has the solicitor done his job in terms of improperly safeguarding them? Are there issues with potentially you know, the court maintaining electronic storage of wills? You know, there there are a number of concerns that are are, are certainly applicable modern context and any kind of digital context which which shouldn't be which shouldn't be understated but they also probably shouldn't be overstated either right yeah i mean i think that there's pros and cons to really all of the approaches they all have their advantages and disadvantages like in terms of accessibility on one hand it seems great because you know in in this year i mean it, it's allowed uh, potentially uh vulnerable testators to make a will and not have to put, expose themselves to uh, the virus. The article also mentions like r rural clients, so they, they can have easier access to their lawyers without having to travel to the city or wherever the closest lawyer is. But then on the other hand, there's a whole kind of population that's not familiar with the technology. So then they get missed and they don't get those advantages. So yeah, I mean, there's there's, I don't know. I don't know what the solution debate to be had, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it'll be an, it's an interesting time, and, and you know we'll, we'll kind of monitor what the what the legislature does in the in the next coming months. Um, as it sits, the the current emergency order that's in place that extends the the order allowing most to be executed virtually has been extended to October I believe twenty second. So I guess the suspic suspicion is that's going to be kind of maintained as long as we're in. in you know, in the circumstances of the pandemic, but we, we look forward to seeing what kind of or what kind of discussions are had going forward. Well, I mean, I think that about wraps up our, our discussion on this topic. With that, let's conclude our podcast. Until next time, we want to thank you for listening. I'm Rebecca Rouse. And I'm Garrett Horrocks. And if you have any questions, please email us at webmaster at hullandhull.com or leave a comment on our blog. See you next time. Take care.